good afternoon and welcome everyone. It's so wonderful to see you all here uh, for this homecoming, really, for Dr. Hannah Valentine and to bring together our community. Um, such a joyous occasion um, to listen and learn from Dr. Valentine. Ilyasha Pete spent years lying next to her son at night, listening to his labored breaths, fearing that they might at some time stop. As a single mother of an asthmatic son in Memphis, Tennessee, Ilyasha struggled to make ends meet so that her son could get the treatments that he needed. Medications, allergy shots, a nebulizer that pumped vaporized medicine into his lungs. But none of these treatments worked for her son. And the reason may be that they were tailored to people of a different race. See, Ilyasha and her son are African American. But the majority of studies conducted about asthma, and indeed of most other health conditions, involve patients of European descent. Case in point, a recent article co-authored by professors Carlos Bustamante and Francisco de la Vega found that 96%, 96% of subjects in genome-wide association studies are people of European descent. Now, I read about Ilyasha and her son in an article in The Atlantic this past summer, and their story Underlies, underlines what I feel deeply about diversity and inclusion and what I have felt deeply about diversity and inclusion over my career. I know that working through these issues together can be complicated, emotional, and deeply personal, but I consider it our duty to create more diverse and inclusive workspaces. That article also speaks directly to the work of our guest speaker today, longtime Stanford faculty member, Dr. Hannah Valentine, who also is NIH's first Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity. In her role at the NIH, Dr. Valentine recruits more diverse researchers, leading to research that fully reflects the de demographics of our society. One of the things that's so special about Dr. Valentine, and the reason I think she's the perfect person to speak to us about these issues, is that through her skills, experience, and her position, she has a compassionate view of the state of diversity and inclusion in medicine, both across the nation and right here at Stanford. As a friend and advisor of mine, I also trust that she will give us her candid perspective on where we are today as a community and how we can continue to move forward. With an extraordinary background as a physician scientist, Dr. Valentine has the intellect as well as the heart to bring transformative approaches to diversity in medicine. She's a senior investigator in the intramural program at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And when she, when she was full-time here at Stanford, she was the senior associate dean for diversity and leadership in the School of Medicine for nearly a decade. She currently maintains an active clinical research program, building on her findings that monitoring the level of donor DNA in a recipient's blood can detect early stages of organ rejection. She and I share the same attitude about diversity and inclusion. To both of us, diversity and inclusion are the only ways that we as medical professionals can make good on our commitments in the Hippocratic Oath to provide comprehensive care for all people. Maintaining a laser focus on diversity and inclusion makes our society more socially just. As physicians responsible for the physical and psychological healing of the world's communities, we must commit ourselves to improving the broader social, economic, and environmental conditions that can be so severe burdens for patients from all walks of life. Moreover, a lack of diversity and inclusion 
impacts the clarity and accuracy of our data, as Dr. Valentine has shown in so many of her pivotal studies. For instance, if we don't gather a diverse set of data from ethnicities and lifestyles around the world, we can't recommend personalized, proactive, and preventive treatments. Without diversity, we can't fulfill our promise to precision health. Ultimately, if we're narrow-minded and waver in our commitment to diversity and inclusion, patients like Ilyasha's son will be at greater risk, and they will continue to suffer. I'm so encouraged by people like Dr. Valentine, who recently received the NIH Director's Pathfinder Award for diversity in the scientific workforce. In a paper that Dr. Valentine co-authored with NIH Director Francis Collins in 2015, she and Dr. Collins described diversity as a scientific opportunity rather than as an intractable problem. They called it a research challenge that can be approached with the scientific method and ultimately that can be resolved. For all those reasons and so many more that you'll hear today, please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Hannah Valentine. Welcome. Glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Lloyd. In fact, you covered my whole talk, and I'm not sure that I have much more to say, but I'll try at any rate. I must say it's such a pleasure to be back. Um, it feels like coming home to friends. In fact, I see people with whom I worked in the very early days when I first came to Stanford uh, in the early 80s are still here and still doing just wonderful work. And so I'm delighted, I'm also delighted to be joining my family here as well. So this is a really, really special occasion, Lloyd, and thank you very much for the inv invitation, which I really, really appreciate. Um, I'm going to be speaking with you about our approach to ad addressing scientific workforce diversity um, through the lens of science. And what I'll be talking about is that the time is now right for us to be injecting the same rigor as we do to the rest of our scientific work into this complex area of workforce diversity. I'll start off by making the point of why diversity is important. You've heard already some very important reasons from Dean Miner. And then I'll talk a little bit about those four cross-cutting challenges that Francis Collins and myself I identified that we fully believe that if we were successful, we would re be reaching really high levels of diversity and inclusion in our scientific workforce. And then I'll talk a little bit about building the evidence and what we can look forward to and how we can sustain this workforce diversity so as to reap the wonderful opportunities that, is, uh, that are embedded when we have diversity and inclusion. But before I start, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I was born in the Gambia, West Africa, a little country which is, uh, has a population of about a million. It was half a million when I left there with my family in 1964, age 13, to go to London. And of course, when I got to London, it was in the 60s, the height of racial tension. And uh, what my parents had not prepared me for was the idea that somebody might think less of me because after all, I grew, had grown up as a part of a majority group. So as you can imagine, uh, entering high school was, had its challenges. Um, and I uh, would admit that I did struggle somewhat um, in those early days as a high schooler. And in part, I would say it was trying to bridge this cultural gap. But of course, the reality 
was there's also the excitement of living in the swinging 60s in, um, in London. Um, and so I, um, I, would, uh, I would say that it was a combination of reasons uh, rather than uh, a lack of diversity and inclusion. That said, I managed to get uh, really good mentors and went to, um, started a degree, went into a degree program at the London University in biochemistry, convinced that I was going to do science later. But then I started to learn about metabolic pathways. I started to learn about cholesterol metabolism. I started to learn about its link to heart disease. And before I knew uh, what I was doing, I was lured away into becoming a physician. But I still had that hankering for science uh, behind me. And so when I completed my residency and training in cardiology as a clinical cardiologist. Can we move to the, to the stage? Yes. <laughs> we can walk around this way okay. You have this whole stage just. Oh, here. okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, that's very good. So, um, <laughs> as I was saying. Um, as I, um, I went to London and then, and then to Stanford for uh, what was supposed to be just uh, two years, otherwise known as getting, going to, uh, to get my BTA, which was been to America, which, <laughs> which was something that was regarded as a must do as a cardiologist at that time. And fortunately, um, two years actually turned into 30. And, um, and there I was, minding my own business, uh, when um, I got the call inviting me to uh, lead the NIH diversity efforts as its first chief officer for scientific workforce diversity. And this was in the, in the wake of the Ginther Report, which was published in 2011, demonstrating that African Americans applying for R01 grants were significantly less likely than any other group to receive that award. And um, the uh, advisory committee to the director recommended, made 13 recommendations, one of which was to establish this office that would be responsible for coordination of NIH uh, diversity efforts. But they also recommended that this person should have a dual role and should have an active role as a scientist, a physician scientist themselves. And it was uh, clear that this would be something very exciting for me, and that is why, as Dean Miner mentioned, I run a laboratory there. And th although this is not the purpose of this talk, I just thought I'd first give you some glimpse of the kinds of things we're doing. I had set up a collaboration here with Steve Quake, whom many of you know, um, and it was a most fruitful collaboration where we're now using genomic tools to monitor patients after organ transplantation based on the fact that the uh, DNA that comes out of the uh, transplanted graft is uniquely different from that of the recipient. And you can do a simple blood test to get the percentage of the donor-derived DNA as the organ begins to be injured and very early on. And so at NIH, um, what I've done is I've set up a consortium of five centers Hopkins, Maryland, uh, VCU, uh, Inova Fairfax, and Washington Hospital, who are all recruiting patients and establishing the biobank. We've transferred the technology, and it's working very well in collaboration with my colleague here, Karen Kush. We've looked at samples, and we've been very successful in doing that. But we're taking the work further. We are looking at uh, d different uh, DNA methylation patterns to, that will help us understand what organ the source of that DNA is coming from. We are also looking at mitochondrial DNA because of its unique uh, method of uh, transmission uh, being uh, translated through, uh, through females uh, through the, uh, the cycle. And we've already recruited and enrolled uh, many patients, over 100. Um, we've uh, collected over 6,000 biospecimens. And I thought I was never going to have to write a grant any longer. But yes, in the last two years, I wrote a U01 application with my colleagues at, uh, at Hopkins. 
So let's turn to diversity, and here's the issue. Um, what you can see here is the diversity across the uh, biomedical uh, career path. And what you'll see is that as you move along the career path, you get less and less representation. So if you look, for example, at women underrepresented in blue, and you follow them on, you see there's minuscule representation at the full professor uh, level. And the same is true for underrepresented men, shown in gray. So that's part of the issue that we want to be addressing and making inroads in. And I'm sure many of you will have heard that this is a pipeline problem. All we have to do is fill up the pipeline and in time things will happen and everything will be corrected. Well, we know that isn't true when we look at what has happened in the case of women. What I'm showing you here is the representation of women in medical schools, uh, medical graduates, approximately 50% uh, for 10 years now, and in the biological sciences, PhDs, it's been more than 50% 15, uh, 50 for 15 years, and yet, when we look, what do we see? As we go up the career path, we have fewer and fewer women, and, um, and so, and while I was here, I did a um, study which was ultimately published in academic medicine where we estimated that it would actually take about 50 years to get equity at the rank of full professor level. Well, I don't know about any of you, but I, don't, I know I don't have 50 years to wait, so <laughs> um, we have to do something early. So why is diversity uh, important? Um, here are four reasons, and there are many others. Um, I believe that diversity is important for excellence of the science in and of itself, uh, and I'll show you some evidence around that. Um, believe that it will broaden the scope of the inquiry if we have a diverse field of investigators who are bringing a diverse per perspective to the field. And um, it's important for even addressing the issue of health disparities as uh, Dr. Minor, Dean Minor, actually alluded to already. And if you don't buy into any of that at all, the f stark reality is that the demographic of this nation is changing and has changed rapidly. So that um, people like myself given a talk like this 10 years ago would say, well, by, uh, by 2020, the minority group will be the majority group. Well, it's actually happened. It's actually happened in certain states and it's actually happened at certain age groups already. So if that is the case, how on earth can we be sure that we really are recruiting the most talented scientists if we're not pooling from our entire intellectual capital? And I would argue that we can't. And for that reason, as including many, we must be, um, be pulling um, and ensuring that we have a diverse scientific workforce. And here is the paper published in PANS that uh, Dean Miner uh, alluded to earlier on, which was co-authored by myself and Francis Collins, when we took a look at all of what was going on and concluded that, in fact, we could view this work as um, an opportunity, an opportunity to recruit and retain the brightest and best, but we must be attentive to four particular areas. And it's these four areas that I will talk about uh, in a moment. The first is the science of diversity. What really is the impact of having a diverse scientific workforce on the quality of the outputs of science? And I ask that question because I think it's very important, but in fact, when we wrote this article, we got some pushback saying, well, of course, you haven't proven that it is beneficial for the, uh, for the majority group that is there already. Um, you haven't shown that the link between the quality of science and that, so why on earth do you want to do this diversity? And I do think it's important for, the, for many reasons which I'll come to. We also talked about identifying the social and psychological and cultural factors that we believe play into the climate of inclusion. And I'll show you some work around that. We also um, want to inject the scientific rigor 
into this field of workforce diversity in the same way as we do the rest of our science, in the same way as Francis was able to push forward the human genome work with rigor and collaboration and evidence and data, we need that here. And more than anything, we need to look at what we have, what's working, and determine how to scale them. So we know that one particular uh, hurdle is the issue of unconscious bias. And I'm sure many of you hear a lot about this. This is um, something that is talked about uh, very widely. And in fact, it was drawn to our attention considerably um, over 12 years ago by the uh, economist uh, Scott Page in this book that he wrote, where he had done some pivotal research uh, to indicate that better uh, problem solving results from a larger, what he called, informational cognitive state. And he argued that diversity outperforms ability every time, and he was able to conduct these experiments where he created hypothetical scenarios designed to reflect the individual's problem solving cap capacities, and then he put people into groups randomly selected, and each time, the diverse or the heterogeneous group was better able to solve the problem than, any, uh, than the homogeneous groups, concluding that groups of diverse um, problem solvers outperform groups of high ability solving uh, people. Now, I'm going to show you some work that has come from other fields because much of this evidence on unconscious bias and uh, science of diversity comes from other fields, but we're gain, beginning to get a glimmer from science itself. And here is one experimental study that was around the uh, diversity and financial decision makers. And what these investigators did was create uh, ethnically homogeneous groups or ethnically heterogeneous groups of skilled financial uh, participants and stock trading and create, had them do some stock trading simulations. And, and what they found was that um, the experimental uh, in, the, uh, this, uh, in the homogeneous group, they were less able to accurately predict the stock and more likely to accept inflated prices and crashed much more when, uh, when that happened. And so that again points to the fact that diversity in uh, teams uh, leads to better decisions. Here's another example, another experimental study, which uh, was around diversity and jury decisions. And um, in this particular study, you have a racially homogeneous group of jurors compared to a racially heterogeneous group. And what was found was that an all, all through this, the, um, the all white or homogeneous groups, um, the deliberations in minutes were shorter, they uh, cited fewer facts, they um, had uh, f uh, greater factual inaccuracies, and um, more less likely to correct those inaccuracies. And the uh, investigators uh, concluded that this was related